All right. How are we doing? Great. Um, so I'll just start with, you know, a few questions as uh, the sales leader here that I encounter and questions that I get a lot. Um, what makes driveline different than all the other everybody else like okay. hitting hitting <clears throat> mechanics wise um how is our process different yeah so like the the place to start is obviously we're we're data driven right um basically what that means uh, is we want to use as much data as we can as much like reliable like advanced metrics things like that uh to help us make our decisions Right. And like where that starts inside of our walls and honestly, even with our remote athletes, like where that starts is with an assessment. Right. You want to know like where someone is at at a given point in time before you go and try to start making any kind of changes. Right. So like in the assessment process, it's like in gym, we are going to go through the HP assessment. I'll, I'll let Whitey talk on that, but like going to mm-hmm. get an idea of who you are as an athlete, more physical profiling. And then on the skill side, hitting specifically, going to get in the motion capture lab, going to get uh Full body biomechanics data, you're going to hit on the force plates. The stuff is paired. So you're going to know exactly how you're moving throughout the entire swing. When you start your load, when you start your stride phase, we have events, checkpoints as we go through it. Uh, so you know exactly how your body's moving through every phase of the swing. We have full signal marker bat data. So we know exactly how your barrel is moving throughout the swing. Like obviously blast sensors is something really important to us, hmm. but there are limitations with that. You're only going to get uh, data points at certain points in time, right? So a lot of it is based off of first move when your hands start moving and things like bat speed, attack angle, vertical bat angle, like your past stuff with the, with the blast sensor, it's only going to read that at contact, right? Great, valuable information, but there's limitations with that. Yeah. In the motion capture lab, we know exactly how your barrel is moving throughout the entire arc of the swing at any point in time, um, down to like millimeter in precision, right? So it's like really, really reliable data. So we know exactly how you're moving, how your bat's moving. We collect a ton of bat ball data with hit tracks, track manner, et cetera, things like that. Uh, and obviously with blast data, right? So we get like a really in-depth look at who you are as a hitter. And with all these different pieces of information, we're basically able to like work backwards from your ball flight to your bat path, to your swing mechanics, how you're using the ground to really target like where your deficiencies are, where the low hanging fruit is. And like we use these things paired with the HP assessment data. Yeah to really drive our decision-making process uh, as far as programming goes. So it's not, we're not guessing. Like, exactly. That, like, long, long-winded way of saying we, yeah. we're data-driven, so we're not guessing. My, you know, my experience is uh, baseball my entire life. Like, coaches see, in my instance, like, hey, you're flying open. Mm-hmm. Well, what am I supposed to do about that? I think the cool thing about driveline is, like, you got metrics and there's there's data behind all of it. This mm-hmm. is why you're flying open and this is what we're going to do to fix it. Yeah. That Maybe. and that that's the really important part, right? Like every hitter on the planet spends a ton of time watching video, right? Yeah, like that's the tons. thing everybody loves, it's the thing they want to go to and like everybody sees things a little bit differently, but for the most part like very common things themes across like hitting flaws, right? Like flying open, you're pushing, like dumping the barrel, things like that. People might describe it differently. Yeah. But people are seeing the same type of thing, right? And and the point you made, like, yeah, no shit, you're flying open. Like, everybody can see that. You know it. Your coaches know it. You feel it. Yeah. uh, And you do all these different things to try to fix it. But a lot of times it's just guessing, right? And a lot of times those guesses are are built from, like, experienced coaches who have gotten guys better doing these things, right? But the value of an assessment specifically is like you can pinpoint exactly what is causing you to fly open yeah. right and it's easier to make the change it's easier to like target that in your programming to make that change faster so not only is the hitter going to understand themselves better you're going to get better faster because there's less guesswork yeah so that kind of transition in, in the whitey like I, I think people buy into that like okay perfect like yeah my swing is messed up like Mm-hmm. help me with it here's here's the data but i think what's lost is like the athletic profile as well like how how we put those together I, that was something i didn't really learn like mm-hmm. or know about how we put those two the athletic profile and like who you are as a, a baseball player put those together that means a lot so like why do you, what in uh in the assessment like the high performance assessment what are we looking for? How do we pair those two together? I, I, I guess like, how do I, how do I tell people more about right. that? You know, yeah. how do, how do they pair together is a good place to start. 
So our, our assessment is going to be almost like opposite end of the spectrum of what they're doing in the mocap lab, right? Like ultimate specificity. Like the only way it could get more specific is if we had fans in the stadium, dirt box, all that, right? Yeah. Like um, we're going the opposite side. We're looking to get general physical qualities because we want to get that like raw force. How much force can you put into the ground? How fast can you do it in as simple of a manner as possible? Because every task we do demands like some level of coordination, some level of force expression, right? Even if you're just picking up a pencil, swinging a bat, whatever you're doing, it's some kind of balance there yeah. where you're needing to coordinate some degree of speed, force, stability, um, whatever. So we get the ultimate specific measure like Tanner's talking about in a mocap lab. So uh, that gives us the benefit to make our strength assessment as simple and trying to get as close as we can to that, those raw physical outputs. Um, so we're using vertical jumps, isometric max strength. Uh, we introduced a plyometric push-up this year. Uh, so just upper body, sagittal, um, bilateral, simple, make it easy. Kids down to 12 can do these tests. Everybody's jumped, right? If you have to do, like when, when we both started here, the, the test was like a VBT, back squat, bench press, compound lifts where- It's come so far. Yeah, <laughs> where they're, they're, those are like pretty simple lifts, right? Like most people have done those, but there's still the degree of skill involved in a back squat is still present, right? Like mm. if you get better, you could have just gotten better at squatting to some extent, For sure. right? Yeah. Which we don't really care about how much better did you get at squatting, Doesn't except translate. for the component that helps you get stronger to translate more force onto the field, yeah. right? So the more of that skill we can remove, the, the more simple we can make it, the closer we're getting to those those properties that are going to actually scale to the field. So then my next question I got for you, how, moving forward um, from that assessment, do you generate certain lifts based on that? Like, is there workout that they're going to do with us based on their athletic profile that we found find in that assessment? And is it going to be like, our back squats going to be part of it and do back squat like, you hear people all the time, they can deadlift a thousand pounds, but they throw 90. Sure. Well, you know, is that like the things that we're looking for in both of these? Like, why can, why are you so strong, but your, your performance isn't well? Like, do you move forward and plan how to get them better, uh, like athletically, things like that? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just add two parts. So first, like, how does the the assessment impact like actual like programming like what they're going to do and it's i would say it's like one layer of context right like one layer of context is what they do in the mocap one layer of context is what they do at the force plates but we also got to think about where are they at in their training year do they have a season coming up mm. uh do they have a previous injuries that we need to work around um guys that are their level of play is going to be is going to change things right like you're going to train a 14 year old different than a big leaguer so it's super specific it's like super yeah. customized to the athlete exactly you're going to Whoever's writing their program is going to be thinking about every layer of context available to them. And that's where the mocap, the force plates adds another layer, right? We're not getting rid of coaching, right? All the things that, that we all grew up around, great coaches are great coaches. We're giving quantified extra levels of context for them to use to educate those things. Mm -hmm. And on the second part, in terms of like what's going to go into those lifts with back squats, deadlifts, whatever, that's going to be built around that context, right? Like if different guys are going to have different needs. And a lot of our pro guys' lifts are going to look a little different if they went through a quality college lifting program, they've been in the minors, come up, they've been in serious weight rooms, they've put in serious work. A lot of those guys are going to tend to need less like capacity work, like where they're, they're working on like that max force production, mm. and their work is going to be more on the specific side of that spectrum, where we're, we're working on the things that are going to help them like stay on the field more, like be robust, powerful athletes, that stuff's so important but also in ways that are going to support the, the energy systems and the, the connective tissues and all of that that's going to translate more directly to the field. Now, there's still going to be your guys like got drafted out of high school, 20 years old, right? Like there's, there's guys in affiliate all through that spectrum still, but that's why it's important to be training like the athlete, not necessarily like the position, the sport, mm -hmm. Because you can look at two different pitchers, you can look at two different outfielders, and those are like totally different athletes, right? Yeah. And that's why having all this information, all this detail is so important because <clears throat> understanding the individual and their, their goals, their history, 
and their their physical profile, their skill profile, all that kind of molds together for you training that like exact individual. That was going to be one of my questions was like, how do you train different positions? Like you go to college, oh, hitters over here, pitchers over there. We're not trained. It doesn't matter to us really. You know? So there's going to be like some of that, right? Like the sprint work for a pitcher versus a position yeah. player is going to be yeah. different because for, for a pitcher, we're going to be using sprint work for the most part to prepare the nervous system, drive neural output, um, and posterior chain development. Like it's going to be like a tool, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And versus a position player, like that's a big part of your job. Like unless you're a DH that's just absolutely slugging and you're not doing much sprinting on the, yeah. on the base paths, um, how fast you are on the base paths, your ability to accelerate on the base paths, your ability to accelerate in the outfield and in the infield, um, the reactive ability, like all of that is going to need to be incorporated into your sprint work because like speed is a skill to, mm. to a pretty high extent. Right. Yeah. And that's one thing that a lot of guys have missed out on in, in baseball that in a lot of other team sports, like football is a good one where as they go up to the levels, they're going to get more refined, like sprint coaching mm. because the, the accelerative mechanics, top speed mechanics, things are going to be different along the way. And that's not something that unless you're a really, really elite athlete, you're going to pick up on your own. And working on little things like that can be the difference between the, the fast guys you see that never steal any bags. It's because maybe they can't accelerate or their first step's bad. And when we're, we're playing game 90 feet at a time, the, every, every little step matters, right? And so those guys are going to get trained accordingly. But the, the general program is going to be very similar. It's just like how much does each guy get of what? And even within position players, right, like a first baseman versus an outfielder is going to get trained differently. Yeah. Uh, an outfielder that speed is a big part of their game is going to train differently than a, a corner outfielder whose job is to slug and not mess up on defense, yeah. right? Um, so, again, like all comes back to, to addressing the individual. Yeah, and then, again, building off all that, like <clears throat> the main takeaway there is, correct me if I'm wrong, Main takeaway there is like it's it's really really important to have all of this high quality data to make the right type of decisions in programming and to get the best results the fastest right like you could the example used like guys pulling off right like you can get like every single hitter at every level is gonna have some issue pulling off in some capacity right like you can have like very generic programming templates that it's gonna like help improve this sort of thing right but when you have like really quality in depth assessment data you can get down to the root cause that like, this is the thing that's, that's like affecting you. That's like making this happen. Mm -hmm. So we can make those changes faster and you could get more specific with the programming. Right. Like, and it's the same thing goes for, for really anything, right? Yeah. Like with bat speed, right? Like we have like a very generic base level bat speed program, like a couple swings with the barrel load bat, a couple handle load, a couple under load, a uh, couple of the game where you have a blast sensor on, you try to track that progress over time. Like everyone is going to gain some level of bat speed with that. Right. But, to an extent, like there's like beginner level gains. You got to like factor in like a guy's training age type of thing. If someone's been doing that for a long time, their body's going to like adapt to that stimulus. Yeah. And eventually you have to like make a change to that stimulus to be able to do that. You have to have like really in-depth data points to like make the correct decisions. And with that, you can get very specific on how you want to improve this guy's bat speed mm -hmm. or how you want to improve their posture. Right? Like that's where the different training bats come into play. That's where different drill types come into play and the progressions through those. Right. And all that being said, like the only way that's possible is with really in-depth assessment data. Yeah. That's good stuff. Um, I think a big, big sell in that because is that we're not, it's super individualized. It's super like customizable. It's super mm -hmm. like it's different than everybody else. Like we were talking yesterday, uh, who has a biomechanical lab like drive lines in, in the world. Nobody. Yeah. Nobody. And, and, and like, there is like obviously like research labs and things like yeah, that, that, yeah, that yeah. have these, these sort of tools, but there, there's nobody on the planet that has the amount of data we have as high quality is on baseball players specifically at all levels. Yeah. Right. Like, all the way down from like eight years old up to like MVP hall of fame type career, big league guys. Uh, it's like, we have marker based data. that's like down to the millimeter or so like yeah. accuracy wise. So it's like, we know exactly how these people are moving throughout the entire swing, how their bat is moving. We have really in-depth data on the bat a ball profile, their bat path, all these things. Uh, 
And like, yeah, there's there's big league teams that have labs and things like that, but they're limited on who they can can collect. Yeah. Right? And yeah. and the sample size of those guys are more limited to the guys in their org. Uh, so all that being said, with our assessment process, not only are we getting like really in depth with where you are at that given point in time, like we can compare that to your previous data, or we can compare that to like a big leaguer, right? Like say the high school, 16 year old high school kid who's like, I want to, uh, like, I want to play in college, right? Yeah. It's like, this is where your data is at. Mm. This is the college average, right? Like you need to get to this point to be successful at that level. And like, Super there's valuable. always outliers in, in different ways, right? Yeah. But it's like really, really clean data and a really easy way to show a guy. It's like, these are the things you need to do to get to this level with that in-depth assessment data. We mm. can make those right decisions, how to get them there fastest. It's interesting because I was just talking to a kid, he, a uh, high school kid, who wants to play at D1. He's mm-hmm. going to junior college and he's like, how do I get to D1? And we have this line. You just out, outlined it. Like, this is how you get to D1 if yeah. you want to be that, that yeah. average. This D1 is what player. the average Division One player is huh. like. This is where you're at. This is how far That's you're sick. away from it. This is the plan to get you there, whether it's yeah. over a year, two years, six months, whatever, based on the time of year. It's like, these are the things we're going to do to help you get to this, to help you accomplish this goal. Mm-hmm. Sick. Let me ask you some hard questions now. Uh, I think on the pro side, I was myself did this. We see a lot of pros when they're maybe struggling at the mm-hmm. end of the rope. Like, why should a pro? Why should a big league guy come in when they're doing well? Okay, let let, let me <laughs> let me. I love this. Let, yeah. let me let me ask you this, right? Like we, I mentioned video earlier, right? Like, yeah. I'm sure you've been in a million dugouts, spent a lot of time around hitters as much as you might not have liked it. Um, Can't stand it. <laughs> that guys love video, right? But like when, when would you say guys go to video more often? When they're struggling. When they're struggling, right? And like a lot of times guys don't get, obviously it's different in the big leagues because there's video on literally everything from every angle you can imagine, right? Yeah. But like guys generally go to video to search for something when they're struggling, mm-hmm. right? And a lot of times when you're like when you're cruising in a really good place, you don't even think about getting video. You're just blacked out and raking, yeah. right? So like a lot of times you don't have a reference point for when you were good. Take that into like even like higher quality data with like a, mo- a motion capture, right? Like guys, a lot of times will have like the big league guy come in after a down year, right? They want to come in. They want to know like what was I doing in 2018 that made me so good compared to now, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously six years is a long time. Yeah. Uh, so it's like, what was I doing then compared to now? And if we don't have that reference point from then, like we're basically just guessing, right? We're going to yeah. pull video. We're going to look into data, see what's different. And like, there's enough of it to where you can make pretty informed decisions and like an educated guess. Right. Yeah. But like a lot of times, one of the best things you could do is like coming off of a maybe the best season of your career or like you're on a stretch at the end of the season where, or even the all-star break or whatever, where you're like, I'm dialed right now. That's a great time to collect your data. So you have something to reference when you are struggling Yeah. rather than just guessing or going to video or there's another thing hitters do is like, I used to feel this, right? So like mm. constantly searching for a feeling, constantly searching so for a feeling, right? And like, that's, that's human nature. I yeah. did the same thing, right? I'd probably do it too, to an extent if I was playing still, um, uh, but yeah, just like having that data when you're in a good place is just as important as having it when you're in a bad place. So you have that reference point to go back to. Yeah, that may be more important than. And, and on the HP side, like if you know you're 25 and you're raking, and then you are 32 now and you're struggling, a lot of people are like, "Oh, well, I'm just older and I'm mm-hmm. not as good a, as an athlete." In my case, I think I was a better athlete. I just got a worse mover. Like I, I was mo- mobility wise, like terrible. So like, is that something we'll compare? Like if they would come in at 25, we get a good athletic profile and they come seven years later, we would compare that. Correct. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and with that too, um, we can like, like we've talked about nonstop to this point, we, with how big our data set is, we can look at just like we talked about the high schooler looking at college, right? Mm. Like we can look at how these different physical properties like sprint speed, uh, power output, all these things change over age. And we can also, um, these things are still trainable, right? Like a 30 year old guy is, is yeah. old in a professional sport, but that's not like an old man, right? Yeah. Um, we've seen guys come in where they're starting to hit that, that point in their career and go right back up because... Like I said, these things are trainable, and a lot of times these guys at the highest level 
Um, not that they didn't they didn't have to work extremely hard to get there, but they were also already like exceptionally talented at the skill side, right? Mm -hmm. And as they progressed through their career, they've probably even like fine tuned that even more and even more, right? Like, um, but clearly best of the best, like Tanner said, Hall of Fame caliber guys. But what's dropping off is that physical side. So everything that we can do to build that back in, like they're not forgetting how to play baseball, right? Yeah. Um, some of the like fine motor stuff might be might be going, but not likely if they're 30. And so if we can start to supplement that physical, start to push it a little bit more than they probably had to do earlier in their career, guys, like you said, can get more athletic yeah. after 30 years old. And they might need to, right? Mm -hmm. Because when they're 25, things are going to come a lot easier. But that doesn't mean that they're, they're impossible to get to when you're 30, 32, 33. They're... It just takes a little bit more concentrated work. So when we can supplement that back in, it's just going to complement that super crazy high level of skill that they had all along, right? And that's you'll see, we've seen plenty of guys having career years after 30 um, because of processes like that. Like they're going to get better at baseball by playing more baseball, right? Yeah. And that's the most important time as a pro. Like you would want your best years to be later in your career when you're making the most money. Like yeah. <clears throat> as, as a pro, you know, like, that, that's what it comes down to is like, uh, how much money can I make? How much, like, how can I extend the life of, of my career? Yeah. Because it is such a short window that you can do that. Uh, I think, you know, as, as a pro ex pro, like you don't realize how quickly it goes. Uh, and, and so I think driveline wants to help you extend that. Like, how can we help you extend that as long as you can? And not when you're at the end of your career, but maybe in the middle, like uh -huh. that's when you extend it in the middle of your career, not, oh shoot, I'm 32 years old. I'm struggling. How do I find something? You know, I think there's something to be said about that. Yeah. Like a, like, like a good example of that, or a guy we've worked with the last couple of years, like JD Martinez. Yeah. Right. Like that's, that's one of the guys who like you were talking about, like highly skilled, like very, very good hitter, uh, has been one of the best DHs in baseball the last 10 years, right? Yes. Sucks uh, to face. Always be. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure yeah. he was terrible to face. Like, he's a great hitter. But when he came in, uh, bef before he, he was with the Dodgers last year, he came in, like, wanting to get some get some juice back. He'd lost some juice his last couple years in, in Boston, right? Came in, wanted to train bat speed. Like, that was his thing. And, like, basically where, where it came down to when we were in the athlete meeting, breaking everything down, it's like when he came up, he was a guy who just had an insane amount of bat speed, right? Mm -hmm. And he, he said this too, right? Like a bunch of bat speed, but his swing sucked, right? His bat path was bad. And then he realized that he started to make changes. He improved his swing mechanics, improved his bat path. And with that bat speed he had, like improved mechanics, improved bat path, he just started to rake and hit a ton of homers, right? The guy's always gone to like center to right center. He's like been very, very good at that because he has a ton of bat speed. Yeah. And then it's like, he, he's historically known as a guy who just like loves to swing, takes a lot of hacks. Um, so like over time when you're taking a lot of swings, highly focused on your mechanics and the move, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, as that's happening, like if you're training slower, you're eventually going to start losing speed, especially as you're getting older. Like he's a guy in his thirties. He's obviously still a highly, highly productive hitter. Um, but he got to the point where he had so much speed when he came up and then he like really made a big change in mechanics. And that's what really let, helped his career take off. And then it's like over time training that way, moving slower, taking a lot of reps, it's hard to like push the, push the extremes of like speed. Right. Yeah. And then just like, as you get older, you're just naturally going to start to lose speed. Like father, father time is undefeated. Right. Like, yeah. but like bat speed training is something that could help you fight that aging curve. But the, the main point I'm trying to make here is JD had like had a ton of speed when he came up, swing was in bad place, cleaned up the swing and still had a ton of speed. And was just one of the best hitters in baseball for yeah. a very long time. Still very good. When he came in, he realized that I had just been training slow for so long that I just need to like get back on the stimulus of moving fast while also like still focusing on the same mechanical concepts, same bat path type of stuff. He just needed to add speed and helped him like turn things around and have a like not a career year, but like got back on track closer to who he was in yeah. the past. So you helped him train the speed after he kind of lost it and he got it kind of back? Is that what you're Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he I mean he had like 75, 76 mile an hour average bat speeds. Yeah, it's like 95th, 100th percentile yeah. like back in the day. Uh, and it got down to like right around league average or so. And he's still a very good hitter. But like when, when he was in Boston, like he's a guy who goes to right center a lot. Yeah. He was just the balls that he used to just like miss hit and hit out to right field because he had a ton of bat speed started getting hung up and caught at the track. Yeah. 
Um, so from there, like he realized like something was different and it was like really huh. clear when you showed him the numbers, it's like your best is down like four miles an hour from 2017 or whatever. Right. Yeah. It's like, holy shit. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. It's like, yeah, if you get this up like a mile an hour or two, like we ran our money barrel script, it's like, you're just going to have 15 more barrels and like 10 more homers. If you get like a mile yeah. an hour, two miles an hour. And he's like, okay, like that makes perfect sense. Trained bat speed, still focused on his mechanics. Um, did a lot of the same things he had done historically, just, uh, put a little bit more emphasis on speed. And I remember the, the first day I sent him programming, like initial day, first day of the bat speed training, uh, I was like programs in there and he hit me up and he was like, what the hell? This is it. Like, cause he's so used to taking a ton of swings. Yeah. Uh, wanted more volume and I get it, but it's like a lot of times when you're like have to focus on speed, you need to cut the workload down, keep the intensity high. And then as you start to build up that workload, you can add more volume on it. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. I, it's crazy that, um, you know, as pros, like we do it all day long. Like I remember when the, the Verlander like baseball thing came out, he's like, Oh, they're all different. And I've got people that ask me like, are, are they actually, can you tell a difference? I, yeah, you can tell a difference. Mm -hmm. Cause the second what, you touch it. it's what we do, you yeah. know, like, um, but it's crazy that to hear JD is like, something's wrong. Like, I think this is what it is. And then he comes in here and we validate that. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to be said. Like a lot of guys know, Hey, something's wrong. I think it's this come in here and let's see if that's actually it. Yeah. You know, and, and get, you got to like credit him. He'd been so 100%. successful for so long doing, yeah. doing the same type of things that he was like willing to seek out some other type of answers and get some feedback. I mean, I think that's how most of those guys get there is like, uh, you know, they're ridiculous athletes, but mm -hmm. also like this insane drive to be better to everyone than everyone yeah, else. It's not complacent. And yeah. like, that's the exact same reason why he's just taking 600 swings a day. It's like really trying to perfect his mechanics, perfect, perfect his path. Yeah. And like, that's something that really helped to be great. Yeah. Just as you get older, you are going to start losing speed, whether you want to believe it or not. Like there, there's no hiding from it. Yeah. You can tell which guys has the, the highest swing speed when you're on the mound. Those are the guys you put your glove up a little quicker. <laughs> you're like, oh. <laughs> uh, two questions. And then, you know, like I do have to go back on sales calls. Um, the, the question that I forgot was, uh, I guess, what makes driveline, like, what makes you different? Like, a, a lot of guys have their guy. Like, they have the guy that they hit with in the off season. They have the guy that they lift with in the off season. Um, what makes driveline different? Like, and how do you work with those guys? Uh, do you, if you are, like, um, different viewpoints. How do you approach those things? Uh, <clears throat> for me, like big, big thing for me is like it, to, at the beginnings, like you have to establish some sort of relationship with the person, right? Like, especially with a big league guy that walks in the door, right? It's like, yeah. you've been doing something your whole career that's made you this successful. Like you got here for a reason, right? So like, you're gonna have very specific things in your routine you like to do. There's very specific like swing concepts, things you like, things you don't like. So it's like one of, one of the first things we do, obviously in the, in the assessment, we collect a ton of data. Mm. Like when we sit down to meet and go over things, like I'm trying to get a feel for who you are, what you like to do, what you're trying to get out of your time here. Uh, and like, I'm not going to not give you the truth of what the data is telling you, yeah. but like, I'm going to try to like gear things closer to like your goals and what you want to get out of this. Mm. Right. I'm going to tell you what this says and I'm going to be real with you. Yeah. But at the same time, like to get the buy-in and get the most out of it, like it's, it's gotta be a little bit more collaborative, right? It's like, I want to do things that you're going to be into doing. Like, I'm not going to give you this drill or whatever, if you absolutely hate it and you feel like it's not helping you, right? Like there's tons of ways to improve things. Again, that's why it's important to have all this data, mm -hmm. right? You, there's like different ways. What is it? A thousand ways to skin a cat or whatever, yeah. right? Like there's, there's a lot of ways you can improve your bat speed. There's a lot of ways you can improve your bat path. There's a ton of drill packages. There's a bunch of different implements, constraints you can use. Um, so like getting a feel for like where the person's at, what they like to do. It's like, it makes it easier with the data paired with it. It makes it easy to like come up with that plan. Mm. Yeah, and, then, the, the, and then from there, like, just like iterate on it as you go. Like it's yeah. gotta be a collaborative process for sure. Yeah. I think the HP side too is like, uh, I think a lot of guys work out with, right. I was that guy. Like I came up here, I just want the pitching. I don't care about the, the HP. Yeah. I have my guy already. Like. Speak to, can you speak to that? Like a Absolutely. Little bit? Yeah. Um, cause a lot of times like you 
probably training with that guy for multiple years, yeah. right? Like All, every off it's <laughs> a lot of trust. Like your body is your career, right? I totally get that. And I think that like how, how I respond to that is that it's not necessarily just like the workouts you're doing with that guy versus the workouts that, that I would write you. It's the entire training system that we're putting together. Like your, your hitting work, your weight room work, everything we've talked about, like your athletic profile, mm -hmm. um, this whole this whole time right like everything from the mocap to the weight room and that doesn't just go into like one piece of building out like what kind of athlete you are that goes into like your training every day and building in those together not just around like tailoring it to you but also in the day-to-day -day because the the assessment is just like a snapshot right the the day-to-day -day is where you're actually like putting in the work to like earn yep. those results in those retests mm -hmm. yeah, for and sure. pairing those together is just as important where we're monitoring workloads in the weight room, we're monitoring your workload with the swings, we're tracking everything, right? So there's no there's no guesswork. We're not, hey, your bat speed's been down for two weeks. Like, oh, are you a little gassed? Like, yeah, like these what, things what are, are you doing in the weight room? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're right. Where we don't have to ask. We know everything's in your track. Everything's in one place. Um, Tanner and I sit twenty feet away from each other. Everything is in is in one place, and it's all built together. Mm -hmm. Again, like not just in the assessment, but that's how it goes through your entire off season and building those things together. Like, obviously, like we could have your guy send, send us your lifts, look through it. But then on a, what if he wants to change something? Is he is he sending Tanner a text? Is he or is Tanner? OK, now going back through and, and thinking, OK, how do I need to modify that around? Um, everything is already built into one system um, that's comprehensive and it lets us build that program out as we go with like those those quick adjustments and we're getting ahead of those things it's not like oh your bat speed's been trending down we're catching those things before they happen mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we're, we're making those adjustments on like a daily weekly level rather than like on a training block to training block level because yeah. if you're if you're training elsewhere obviously there's incredible strength coaches all around right and you're just doing your retest with us and there's plenty of guys where they'll come in, they'll assess at the beginning of the off season, they'll leave, go home, lift with somebody there. They come back in before spring training, and they've been working their butt off. Swings looking better. We get them on the plates, and they're the same guy that they were in October. Hmm. And that's usually a moment that it kind of clicks for a lot of guys because we know and we can show like how important these properties are to scaling to to the field with bat speed and sprint speed and all these things. And nobody wants to feel like they just wasted three months. Right. Yeah, especially when you like, you're really still getting after it right. really hard. Yeah. And again, that doesn't Steps. mean that there's not incredible strength coaches. It means that we don't know every step along the way. Right. Cause there's plenty of guys that can, you get a lot of guys get better over the course of the offices that don't train with us. Yeah. Right. But it eliminates almost all of that risk of it, of it not, because we're catching it on a daily and weekly level rather than an off season level or on a monthly level. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's so important because the margins are so, so small at the top and in getting there, you do not have months to not get better because other guys are getting a lot better and domestic reserves aren't that deep these days. Like it's, it's tough to get on, stay on a 40 man, stay on a big league roster, yeah. extend your career. Like, we always talk, everybody talks about replacement level, like that replacement level is getting better, right? So much like, better. Yeah. Um, league's getting younger. The margins are so slim um, that I think that really it's all about like every possible thing we can do to, to widen those margins and putting everything together, tailing it around the individual, having the most comprehensive plan built around gold standard assessment data, and then again, monitoring that on a daily and weekly level that's that's the best that we can do to to widen that margin hmm. that's pretty pretty sick yeah um, <laughs> yeah yeah I, I think th there's a lot of value in that um and, you know kind of to speak to my last question i guess is why do you tanner why do you why do you, like why do you do this and why does driveline care? Because, you know, I, I think there's a misconception maybe with driveline that, hey, we have all this data. We are like, um, I don't want to say nerds. I don't think ner maybe nerds is 
maybe we brand there, ourselves. There's a little bit of some of that. There's some nerdiness mixed in here. Uh, but why does Driveline actually like care about your career and uh, speak to a little bit about like our Slack channel and, and uh, that thing blows up with athlete results. Um, and yeah, just just like I guess tell me or tell everyone. Like, yeah. Wh- yeah. Why does so so like more, more on my end like love baseball right been my life you know yeah. and like i i want to see the game grow i want to see it develop i wanted to get it i want to see it get better uh i was fortunate enough to come in here at driveline like right around the time hitting started like our very first college summer started winter 2016 i got here summer 2017. um and like when i got in like pitching was so much further ahead right and just in general pitching development is ahead of hitting development but i i got to get in basically on the ground floor like right around the time pitching was starting to take off mm-hmm. And I saw the impact that driveline was having on the game of baseball, specifically on the pitching side. It's like, I want hitting to catch up to that and do the same type of thing. Uh, at the end of the day, it's like, I just care, I care about the game. I want it to get better. I want players to get better. And it's like, come a long way. Build, building off of Whitey's point, like yeah. we get the best results generally when guys are doing everything with us. But like, if you got a strength coach who's helping you elsewhere and like things are going well, it's like, that's fine. Go work with him. Like at the end of the day, what well, we care about are your results, you getting better, however that's happening. Um, basically where I was going with this, uh, I saw driveline pitching really taken off and just like, I wanted hitting to catch up, right? Mm-hmm. Like I wanted to get there. I love, I came from working, uh, I was coaching at an NIA school in Arizona. Like I never thought I'd ever leave the field. The second I got here, like one, I fell in love with like technology and like, I immediately saw how it made my job easier and it made me a better coach. Um, but like just like the ability to learn, the ability to grow and like impact a lot of different hitters from different places. I remember after that first summer, uh, like once the spring started, the spring season, all the guys who worked in the summer, like I just like pull up all their stats pages. I was like going to follow how all these guys were doing for different places. And again, like I never thought I'd leave the field because I loved having my group of guys for a couple of years. Yeah. But after that first summer here, like the ability to impact guys at a bunch of different places, like I immediately fell in love with that. And then in my time here, like while I was working here, like I've gotten further away from the floor, more managing, things like that. Uh, And like quickly started to get more into like coaching coaches Mm -hmm. and developing guys that way, uh, which I didn't think I was going to like at first. But I I fell in love with that, too, because like I immediately saw the impact I was able to have on these people who could then go out and impact a bunch of other hitters. At the end of the day, that's just impacting baseball and like growing, growing the game, growing hitting development and getting hitting closer to where pitching is at yeah, still, a lot of fulfillment still, in that. still not really there, but For sure. closing that gap. Well, that's what I, I you know, I was going to, I think you probably have a lot to do with this is like hitting has come so far here. I mean, I think that's kudos to you, man. Like, for real. A lot of kudos to our R&D team, yeah. sports science, sports staff. But. Yeah, the whole driveline crew, like, um, I don't want to say hitting's overtaken pitching here because I, I, they're probably similar. But I think that, that speaks to, like, what driveline is. And, and I've only been here for a few months, but, like, it's so fun to be here and, like, see the background of what goes on here. Like, we're always pushing ourselves to be better. What's next? What are we doing next? How do we do this better? And what it moves we... fast. Yeah. And it moves really fast. It's awesome. And, like, the... and this is because everybody really gives a shit. Yeah. Right? Like, everybody just cares. And it, it's cool. I, I think it, it's such a cool place. To, um, yeah. And then why do you, I guess for you, like what, why do you do this? I mean, you know, is, is strength training your, your background? Like, um, you speak to that a little bit. Sure. So, so starting out, like getting, getting into this, um, probably l- lucky to have like some really good mentors. I would say, um, a big part of my background in this came from like, I lifted with a, a really good strength coach in high school. Curtis Van Wick's his name. And then I, I go off to college and at my JUCO, my freshman year, we lifted at a CrossFit place. Um, and my sophomore year, we didn't have anything. And I knew from training with somebody who knew what they were doing before, how important it was. I had seen in my own high school career, like how much putting on the right kind of weight, getting stronger, getting more explosive had, had impacted on the field. Mm-hmm. And I could just feel those things going. And so I knew I had to like, how do I do these things? And then as I learned more and applied that with myself, with teammates, then I, I got lucky to have another great re- mentor when I got to University of Portland, Bryant Ferrati. He's a baseball strength coach there now. Um, just the absolute man and was able to pick his brain, keep learning more. And 
that kind of transition once I once I was out of eligibility there I stayed to as a as a student assistant in the weight room working with him and getting to work with guys that had been a lot of them the underclassmen as teammates right and getting to see because it's so tangible the work you put in is what you is what you get out right yeah. like things don't always go according to plan on the field mm. but in terms of guys setting themselves up and over four years or five with the COVID guys, yeah. um, you can make a lot, you can cover a lot of ground. And I think just like, like Tanner said, we care about these guys and getting to like see that progress. And then on the other side too, a little bit working in a place like this, you get to kind of be a little bit of a mad scientist, right? Like yeah, we're saying. innovating world-class R and D sports science, force plates, markered mocap, now markerless mocap, like yeah. the resources are incredible. The data set's incredible. So on one side, it's like really caring about these guys as individuals and like really getting that fulfillment when they have a career year, sign a new contract, make a level that they haven't been before. Guy gets to play college baseball that came in for a gap year having zero offers and now he's going to a JUCO or going to a D3 or even some of these guys going to D1s, right? Like that side is so fulfilling, so fulfilling. But on the other side too, that like mad scientist side of like, taking a lot of pride in our work and pushing that edge, pushing that frontier of the field. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits of having like such specialized people that also like a lot of our backgrounds have overlap, right? So like work really well together. We're able to collaborate on these athletes, these projects, but really getting to like push the boundaries with world-class resources and like getting to actually test, like I have this idea it's based on these concepts that I know work. I think that if I put them together this way, they'll work. And rather than just like, oh, yeah, that athlete had good results because who knows if that was because of what you had him do in the weight room, right? We can isolate these things with the force plates, sprint times, field results in a big sample size. And you can start to actually see like how the different pieces of what you're doing show up, matter or don't and adjust, right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's the two things like caring about the athlete and then also like the pride and and um quality of work too that I think we we all really really care about and honing our craft and there's a lot of a lot of ambition in that and, and pushing the ceiling for baseball performance in general is something that I think a lot of our employees are super super passionate about yeah, that's pretty cool even like it's, it's funny I feel like there's no dumb question here like Nothing, no. ask them even yesterday I was like we were talking about the the assessment and I was like can you measure this and I was like oh sorry that's a dumb question it's like, like no, no, we should, no, no, we should abso do that. absolutely not. We, yeah, we, it, that's a great idea. It's pretty cool. Like you know, like the innovation. You're speaking to the innovation, like stuff that happens back here. You know, all the stuff on the floor. You know, that's awesome. But I think a lot happens back here in this office, and mm -hmm. um, it's so cool. It really is.